So let's give it about one more minute to let people find the link, sign in, uh, make sure they're in the right place. If you would like to ask questions, one thing that you can do now is that uh, YouTube does this odd thing where you need to establish a YouTube channel in order to ask us questions in the chat. Uh, if you haven't done that, if you see in the live chat to the right of the window that you need to establish a YouTube channel, it's a really quick process. You can just click that link and I think it will be done for you in about five seconds. Uh, if you're having trouble, send send me an email and I hopefully we'll see it before the talk wraps up and can uh, get some feedback quickly and resolve it for people who are having trouble. All right, so we've got about 50 people and it's about two after eight. So uh, I think we should take off. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is our very first Universe at Home event. My name is Nico Adams. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of Minnesota studying astrophysics and specifically I study star forming galaxies. And I'll pass that along. Uh, I'm Alexander Criswell. I'm also a graduate student in astrophysics at the University of Minnesota and I study gravitational waves. And then I am Trevor Knuth. I am a fifth year astrophysics graduate student. Um, and I study the sun and really high energy events like solar flares. So this, is, uh, this event is coming to you as a part of a series, which we hope will become a lot more regular as the summer goes on. This for us is not only our first event in the Universe at Home series, but this is our first online outreach event uh, as a department that we have ever done. So this has been a long time uh, preparing and a lot of stress on our part, making sure that we know how to use technology like live streaming uh, and that we have all of you in a place where you can interact with us just the right amount. So we hope that this will go smoothly. And if not, please try to let us know any way you can. And we'll be sort of taking feedback and adjusting as we need to throughout this presentation. Uh, also, at any time throughout the talk, feel free to leave us a question, either about the talk or about something about space that you just want to know. So uh, if you cannot access the chat right now, it should be to the right of this window if you're viewing this on a computer. And uh, at any time, feel free to type in a question. Oh, nice. Excited to be here. Uh, I'm also excited to be here. So. <laughs> That's good to see. Uh, so at any time, leave us a question and we'll do our best to answer it. Uh, Trevor will be acting as our moderator tonight. So he'll be looking over some of the questions and raising them up to me, who will be uh, the speaker for the main talk. So I'll spend about 20 minutes talking. Uh, we'll spend some time doing some questions and answers, and then we'll end uh, closer to 9 PM with uh, a virtual tour of the planets, because this is a very planet-themed talk. So let me see if I can get my screen set up. All right, uh, Alexander or Trevor, am I, am I coming through? Yeah, I can see you. Perfect, okay. All right, so this talk is, I decided to call it Wandering Stars. And it's about, uh, it covers about 4,000 years of human history. It's about how we discovered the planets and how we came to appreciate what they are. So I wanted to start by just showing the planets as they appear in the sky, uh, not tonight, but last night. So. Basically, they'll look about the same tonight. This is a simulation in a virtual planetarium program known as Stellarium, which we will actually use later to take you on our own virtual tour of uh, the planets. So you can see Mars off to the left over here, if you can see my mouse. Uh, and you can see Saturn and Jupiter kind of clustered over to the side, directly to our south. So this is where they'll appear in the night sky. At, uh, I don't remember exactly what time this is tonight, but during the virtual sky tour, we'll have a better idea of that. Uh, now I want to fast forward one year, which we can do in the software. And this is what the planets will look like. So you can see everything about the image is almost exactly the same. We've got, uh, if you look at any of the stars that are not the planets, the stars jump just a little bit, but they're almost all in exactly the same place. The planets are completely scrambled. So you'll see Jupiter has uh, completely leapfrogged over Saturn. And uh, Mars is not even pictured, because it turns out it's actually on the complete opposite side of the night sky. So imagine the frustration of, of ancient astronomers when they were looking at a sky full of thousands of points of light, uh, carefully cataloging all those locations, and they are all staying exactly fixed relative to each other. 
And then there are just these five that are just moving around all over the place, not in any particular pattern that they can discern, but in this really complicated sort of interweaving, interlocking pattern where uh, some of them keep staying very close to the sun, like Mercury and Venus. Some of them are sort of crawling at a very slow pace around the entire sky, like Jupiter and Saturn. And one, Mars, has this especially weird pattern of motion, which looks like this. And what's happening is Mars is actually moving across the sky, uh, changing direction, turning completely back around, and then changing direction again, and moving the opposite way around the, uh, across the sky. What's really happening here is Mars is moving in a circle around the sun, but so are we. And so like a complicated like theme park ride where you have circles within circles within circles of motion, uh, it looks to us like Mars is moving back and forth just because of our point of view as we both go around the sun in different ways. Uh, astronomers back then had no idea that we were going around the sun. So they had no way of explaining this. Uh, because ancient cultures didn't know what to call these objects or what they were, uh, the ancient Greeks just named them planets, which just means wanderers. So they're things that wander the night sky. So the earliest record of a planet is actually something that we have uh, a picture of, which is really cool. Uh, somebody in ancient Babylonia actually wrote down the rising and setting times of Venus in about 1700 BCE, which is nearly 4,000 years ago. So most of astronomy for all of human history was just this. It was just people looking up in the sky with their unaided eye and writing down what they saw, and they kind of hoped for the best. So it was very difficult to get anything done. And the timeline of like astronomical discoveries that were new uh, was for thousands of years pretty empty. We couldn't really do much. Uh, all of a sudden, in the 1600s, uh, everything changed because astronomy stopped looking like a person writing things down and started to look a little bit more like a person looking upwards through a telescope, a device that specifically magnifies the night sky. So the telescope is so ingrained in people's image of what an astronomer is like that it's very hard to imagine a time without it. But uh, most of what we discovered about planets was after the telescope was invented. So even though we've known about them, we've seen them for so many thousands of years, we had no inkling of how to study them until we were able to look at them up close. So this happened in the early 1600s when Galileo Galilei, an Italian scientist, caught wind of this new invention that sailors were using called a spyglass, which could magnify distant objects. Uh, and he built one of these for himself for looking at the sky. And Jupiter suddenly switched from being just this image on the left of a point in the night sky to the image on, a right, on the right, which is this really rich, colorful, uh, complicated object. Uh, it's got many different color bands, and it even has some of its own moons, which was really surprising because up to that point, we only knew about one moon, which was the Earth's moon. So if you ever get a chance to look at Jupiter through a telescope, you will actually see those four moons. They're known as the Galilean moons, and they are the brightest ones associated with it. So it's very easy to see. Uh, they're almost impossible to miss if you look at it through the right telescope. So using telescopes, we began to understand a lot more about the planets and their properties. Uh, all that said, if you asked someone how many planets there were in Galileo's time, they would probably still have answered about six. Uh, Mercury, Venus, some people would have said Earth, depending on when you asked. Uh, Jupiter, Mars, out of order. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And these were the planets that we could see with the naked eye. It took another 200 years for the next big discovery to be made in like the world of the planets. So this discovery was almost entirely an accident. And I want to set the scene just for a minute. Uh, the year is 1781. America is about to win the Revolutionary War. And in Britain, a few astronomers are busy surveying the sky with their telescopes. One of them is named William Herschel, and he's given himself the job of finding as many stars as he can that are just barely too faint to see with the human eye. So while looking at the constellation Gemini one night, he notices something that's really odd to him, which is that there's a new star there that did not used to be there. And he's looked at Gemini, as have many astronomers many times before this, and not seen this weird object that has suddenly appeared there. So he looks back a few nights later, and not only is that object still there, it's moved just a little bit, which is unlike any behavior that any star uh, shows. So he starts to think, this must not be a star. This must be one of the wanderers, like the same things that the ancient Greeks looked at. Uh, this must be a new planet and the first one that we've discovered since ancient times. So astronomers agreed pretty quickly that this was not a star, this was a planet. And this was a discovery that made worldwide news at the time. So as many of you know, this new planet, the next one after Jupiter and Saturn, came to be known as George, the seventh planet in the solar system. Uh, if you want its full name, Georgium Cetus, or George's planet, which is the name that William Herschel proposed to honor his king, King George III of England. Uh, that is the one that America fought for revolution against, uh, fought for independence against. So 
Of course, this name did not stick because every astronomer outside of Britain was insulted that Herschel would even consider naming the new planet after a British king. Uh, a few people suggested that we name the planet Herschel after Herschel himself to honor it for the discovery. But even calling it Herschel was considered too much of an honor for Britain, the country where Herschel did all of his work. And astronomers and other nations basically objected to this idea. Uh, the problem was that we had never had to name a planet before, or we hadn't for uh, since the dawn of human civilization, basically. So in the end, what, what scientists decided was most neutral and most fair was to just stick with the same name scheme that we used many thousands of years ago when we were naming them after ancient uh, gods. So the best name that they could come up with was Uranus, the Greek god of the sky. And that's how we ended up with a planet that was named Uranus rather than a planet named after someone named George. So after its discovery, uh, Astronomers were pretty rocked by the idea that there could be an entire planet in the solar system that they just did not know about. Uh, and after they started studying Uranus's orbit, they found something peculiar. Uh, during one part of its orbit, Uranus traveled a little bit faster through the sky than astronomers were expecting. So it was sort of speeding up past where their telescopes were pointing. And they realized like they needed to adjust a bit more based on what they expected it, uh, the way they expected it to move. And during the other part of its orbit, it slowed down again and moved a little bit less than they expected it to move. So many scientists had an idea of gravity at this point as uh, this very simple force that tugged on things one way or tugged on things another way. The only way that Uranus could be moving in a way that we don't expect it to is if there is another source of gravity than the sun tugging on it and having it uh, orbit the sun. So a few scientists sort of guessed at the right answer, which is that there was a planet just beyond Uranus whose gravity was pulling on it and changing the shape of its orbit just a little bit. And the credit for working out how this happened goes to a couple of scientists, but most people now agree that the most notable one was an astronomer in France named uh, Urbain Le Verrier, uh, a terrifying name if you do not know the French language very well, so I'll do my best to pronounce it. So by this time, we had a really good understanding of how gravity worked at a mathematical precise level. So Le Verrier, did something very different from what Herschel did. Uh, Herschel spent years trying to discover new stars and new things in the sky just by looking, just sort of by scanning the sky and saying like, okay, haven't seen that before, uh, let's write it down. Uh, Le Verrier was looking for something very specific. And he actually did not use a telescope for any of his observations or any of his work at all. Uh, he, the story goes, spent years performing a calculation just using a pen and paper. And this was a calculation of how this planet would affect Uranus's orbit and exactly where this planet would need to be to explain uh, the slight perturbation of where Uranus was in its orbit. And after spending years on this, uh, he developed an equation that was pages long that involved 500 different terms added together. And in 1843, he finally plugged in all of these measurements that astronomers had been taking of the planet into his gigantic equation. He made a prediction about where to find the new planet in the sky. Uh, he wrote it down, he sent it to Germany to a Berlin observatory and when it arrived five days later, they checked with their telescopes that very night and it was there. So the amount of work required with a telescope was one day. The amount of work required on pen and paper was uh, several years. And it was some of the most intricate mathematics that had been done in science to that point. So Neptune's discovery was this huge point of pride for all involved, especially Le Verrier, uh, who quickly proposed that they name the planet after him. And there were a couple of French uh, newspapers and French periodicals at the time that suddenly were like, hey, yeah, uh, that planet that we named a while ago, uh, that's called Herschel, after the person who discovered it. Uh, and he was British, but Le Verrier, who we're going to name this new planet after, he is French. So this is a point of pride for France. Uh, what actually happened is astronomers did not go for this idea. Uh, people were generally against the idea of naming uh, a, an entire planet, this very symbolically important thing, after any one person or any one thing associated with an entire nation like France. So in the end, they basically went with another Roman god, and they went with one that explained this planet's blue color, and that was Neptune, the god of the sea. So this was a huge triumph at the time. Uh, the discovery of Neptune is a famous story in astronomy because it proved that a scientist working with only a pen and paper could make the same sort of discovery that it usually took years of searching with a powerful telescope to do. Uh, unfortunately, there's a less known case where this did not work. Uh, I can't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have heard the planet, uh, heard of the planet Vulcan? And if you have, congratulations on either doing your research or being a big fan of Star Trek, because outside of fiction, 
the planet Vulcan does not exist, but it's nonetheless a real thing that we tried to search for for 60 full years. Uh, so how did this happen? And the way it happened is we had known since about the 1700s that Mercury was moving just a little bit oddly, that something was something about its orbit wasn't quite right. And it was really subtle, but we had centuries of measurements of Mercury that we were now adding up and realizing uh, this is a real effect that we're seeing and we can't explain it uh, using any of the things that we know about in the sky. So Le Verrier was uh, hot off of the victory of discovering this new planet, Neptune, and basically said, well, Uranus was moving oddly, and it was because it was another planet perturbing it. What if Mercury is moving oddly, and it's because there's another pl planet perturbing it? And if Le Verrier was right about this, the solar system would have looked more like this. So we'd have this new planet as number one, followed by Mercury the second, Venus the third, and then Earth as the fourth planet in the solar system which would have really upended like the way that we think about the way the solar system works. It would have really changed the order. So the planet was named after uh, the Roman god of fire, Vulcan, before it was even found, because we knew that if anything was that close to the sun, it would just be a scorched wasteland. It would be so hot and so barren that it would be uh, just impossible to sustain life. And it would be by far the hottest object in the solar system. Unfortunately for Verrier and those searching for this planet, 60 years of looking turned up nothing. Uh, there were scattered reports and rumors from all over the world because everyone was uh, sort of had an eye out for this object and thought it would be the biggest uh, success in their career if they could find it. What actually happened is that Albert Einstein came along a few years later and proposed that gravity doesn't work quite the way we think it does. So in 1915, he came out with the general theory of relativity, which stated that uh, gravity in a place as powerful as the sun can actually warp space time. And that slight warping of space time is enough to explain why Mercury doesn't move like we think it does. So that's a complicated topic that deserves its own talk. But uh, once we figured it out, we abandoned the idea of Vulcan for good because it is no longer needed to explain why Mercury moves the way it does. So one of my professors on a paper that I wrote about uh, astronomical history actually proposed that I put the Vulcan story into the paper, not because it was related to what I was talking about, but because it was a side tangent that was just so interesting that he was sad that I didn't mention it. And uh, the idea is that Vulcan gets a lot of love among scientists today. And in fact, the name Vulcan is actually still on reserve for any planet that we find that's closer to the sun than Mercury. So we are now 99% certain that none exists, but it would just be too sad to give the name Vulcan to another planet after all the effort that we went through to find this one that turned out not to be there. So there's one object that I've left out uh, and many of you are probably not happy about that, and that is Pluto. Uh, that's one that is very fond to us who grew up in the age where Pluto was still considered a planet. And it used to be that it was sort of the period on the sentence that was the planets. It was this tiny exotic object that was very far away. Uh, in 2006, it was demoted from its planet status. And the reason is that Pluto was taken down because there were so many other objects that we were discovering in that region of space that uh, it was kind of causing a crisis in science. Uh, a few of those objects are actually on this chart. So one of them is Eris, which we discovered in 2003. And another is Makemake, which we discovered in 2005. Uh, they're orbiting in the same region as Pluto, like very, very far away from the sun. Uh, and it was estimated after scientists started finding objects like this that not only were they very similar to Pluto, but there might be as many as 50 of them out somewhere in the solar system. So astronomers had to decide whether or not these things were planets or not. And if they were, it was really going to upend their idea of the solar system as this sort of nine planet system. It could be 60 or it could be hundreds. Uh, and astronomers suddenly realized that they had no idea what a planet was. After 4,000 years of studying them, we had actually never come up with a definition. So we were left with two choices, either define a planet more precisely and drop Pluto from the list or keep Pluto, but risk having to add 50 more planets as we discovered these new objects further out in space. So in the end, we went with the stricter definition and we cut Pluto. But the nice part of this story is that Pluto now has a lot more company than people realize because there are all of these objects out here, Makimaki, Eris, and even uh, this very large asteroid series in the asteroid belt that are very similar to it, that all get the designation dwarf planet. So that brings me almost to the end of the talk. I'd like to wrap up with an activity. Uh, in 1930, Pluto was discovered a lot like Neptune was, and an astronomer predicted where it was and then checked. But unlike Neptune, Pluto was much smaller and much farther away, 
So the challenge of trying to find it was a lot higher. So here I've actually pulled up the original slides that were used to discover Pluto. These were the original photographs of space that were taken. And between these two slides, all of the stars remain the same, but Pluto jumps from one place to another. So the challenge is, can you spot Pluto between these two plates? I'll flip back and forth for about 30 seconds. So remember, you're looking for the object that's jumping between one plate and the other. If you're searching and you have no idea, it's near the middle of the plate. So for me, that would not have been enough time. I am going to move on in the interest of answering some of your questions and uh, making sure that we reach the end of the talk. So here's the solution. There's a tiny dot here in the first plate. And six days later, there's a tiny dot here in the second plate. Uh, that's Pluto. So that's actually how it was discovered. Clyde Tombaugh is the name of the discoverer of Pluto. And he looked at a million pairs of plates like this to make this discovery. So the machine that he used did exactly what you just saw. About every second, it would just flash between these two images. And he would just look for the difference between them. So it's very hard to tell which point of light is the one that we're looking for. I actually got stuck because I was seeing something up in this region that seemed to be jumping around. And some of you may have caught that instead. So I'm not sure how he would have uh, told that apart from Pluto. It's, it was a very challenging, very messy problem. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Clyde Tomba is the greatest spot the difference player in human history. So it certainly paid off in this discovery. Uh, what's cool about this to me is that despite all the technology and all the work involved, uh, Clyde Jumba basically did the same thing that ancient astronomers did. He looked at a field of stars and he noticed one of them wandering. And that kind of brings it full circle where even the most distant hard to find object that we have found was just a wandering star that uh, we found with the exact same techniques and with more information, but uh, in a very symmetrical way that we found them in ancient times. So that brings us to the end of the talk. So we were about to move on to taking your questions. Before we do, we'd like to thank the sponsors of this event, the Minnesota Space Grant College Consortium from NASA, NASA and the National Science Foundation who offer funding for us to do these events. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. All right, so Trevor, are you there? Yep, this is, yeah. But, uh, gotcha. Yeah. So I will give you a round of applause uh, in lieu of the folks who are putting uh, clapping emojis into the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I have not been able to see the chat, actually, because I have this talk open on top of it. So uh, I want to leave this talk open so I can't see what you guys are writing. But uh, Trevor and maybe Alexander can promote some questions to my attention. So we don't have any quite yet, but of course there is that, that little bit of latency. Um, so I think we should see some coming in fairly shortly. Sure. If we don't see some soon, we can switch to the virtual sky tour just a bit early. Mm -hmm. So we can, uh, one of the cool things about Stellarium, the program that we're going to use to show you the tour of the sky is it is a free piece of software. Uh, any of you can download it if you have a computer. And not only that, but there's an online version that actually works without you having to download anything. You can just enter a URL and that will take you to sort of like Google Maps. It will take you to a map of the sky and you can use all of these cool tools. Like uh, you can switch the date to a thousand years in the future. Or if you want to do some observation in a week, you can switch it to a week in the future at like the exact time of night they want to be observing at the exact place in the world you want to observe and with the exact conditions that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, so it's a really cool piece of software if you're interested in the night sky and it's just fun to use. All right, it looks like we have a few questions coming in. The first question is, are there objects bigger than Pluto in the Kuiper belt? So I believe that's true. Uh, I believe either Eris or Makimaki or a third object that we found actually around that time named uh, Haumea, which I think I'm pronouncing right. One or multiple of those is bigger than Pluto. Uh, Pluto is actually so small that it's smaller than the Earth's moon. So that's not a huge surprise, but it is not the biggest one. It is definitely sort of a dwarf even among dwarf planets. 
So I, I think what's interesting about that is that uh, we had to sort of cut down on the definition of planet because there is just no way to keep planets like that or objects like that out of our planet definition if we're going to inclu include Pluto. All right. The next question that we had is, do you have a favorite planet and why? <laughs> I, I feel like we can pass that around between the three of us, actually. That might be a fun thing to do. Uh, I'm going to give a very lame answer first. And my favorite planet by a very large margin is Earth. Uh, that's not what you're looking for as an answer. And I know that. Uh, but it is. It is the planet that brings me the most happiness. And it is the planet that allows us to study the other planets because it has the best conditions. Uh, Aside from that, I'm really interested in Mars. And the main reason is just that it is sort of our twin in a lot of ways. Like it is uh, a really similar size to Earth. It doesn't have quite the same conditions as Earth, but it's the one that we always look to as, uh, it's not just an object in the sky. It's something that more and more we're starting to look at as we can do something with this. And it also was the most interesting in ancient times when it did that weird reversal thing that I showed in one of the slides earlier. Uh, so it was this massive puzzle in ancient times, and now it's this very different massive puzzle as to how do we sort of settle on this planet in modern times. I'd say for me, my favorite is probably Saturn. Uh, I just <laughs> think it's incredibly gorgeous. Um, the rings are absolutely beautiful, and I, I really fondly remember the first time that I saw it in a telescope uh, and was able to make out the uh, the rings around the planet. It's just really pretty. I regret saying Mars. I also want to say Saturn. now. <laughs> no take backs. Uh, mine is definitely Jupiter for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's exceptionally easy to see with the eye. I believe it is the brightest object that is not like the moon or the sun. Might be though. It might be at yeah, the third brightest object in the sky. It is very bright, so it's very easy to see. Um, it is also a magnetically like hyperactive planet. So I study a lot of magnetic activity on the sun, uh, and so studying the Jupiter sort of magnetosphere, you see a lot of interesting similar events happening with the planets. Um, the moons opening Jupiter, kind of spewing out plasma, getting trapped in those magnetic fields, and creating aurora bigger than the size of Earth. All right, uh, another question. We had, could you say anything about Ceres? Yeah, so this is there's a lot of really interesting stuff that I did not get to talk about. And Ceres is, a really, is one of those really interesting things. Uh, Ceres is a really unique object because it fits into the classification of dwarf planet. It's big enough and massive enough that it has all the properties of something like Pluto. But it is way in the middle of the... Uh, of the solar system. It's here in the asteroid belt, rather than way out here in what we call the Kuiper belt, which is a belt of smaller objects that is much further away past Neptune. Uh, the reason that's interesting is that it is not only closer to us, but it also uh, is something that we've sent a probe directly to, to study the Dawn probe. And it is known to carry water. So there is at least a little bit of evidence that there is water at certain parts of Ceres's surface. And that means that it's actually a target where we are looking for life on that rock, uh, on that dwarf planet. So there's a lot to dig into there. It's not a planet or a dwarf planet. I'm going to say planet a lot as I, as I talk about this, because I just say that when I get excited. Uh, <laughs> it's not a dwarf planet that I definitely am an expert on, but uh, it's one that as I learn more about it, I just get more and more excited about. It's also surprising to me that it is about 14 times smaller than Pluto by some measure. And so on the scale of dwarf planets, it's very tiny and it's much closer by. So it kind of, it breaks all the patterns that all the other dwarf planets live by. All right, uh, the next question is, where is Starlink? And will space become polluted with satellites and other objects that man has put there? So I was watching an event that the Bell Museum put on that is similar to what we're doing. Uh, and they pulled up a website that actually showed the location of all the active Starlink satellites. Uh, I don't know how to access that, but I think it is worth looking up if you want to learn more about this. For my part, uh, Starlink is a, for those who don't know, a network of satellites that's being launched by uh, SpaceX, which is 
the company led by Elon Musk, who also does Tesla and uh, astronomers are very worried about it at the moment. And the reason is that the Starlink satellites are, first of all, massively increasing the number of satellites in orbit in order to deliver internet to people who may not otherwise be able to access it. But in the process, uh, reflecting a huge amount of sunlight. So when you catch them at the right angle, which is very common, uh, they will suddenly look as bright as some of the brightest stars in our night sky. Uh, for astronomers, that's a huge problem because they're not only bright, but they're also wandering across our field of view and there are going to be thousands of them. So there is one particular survey, the uh, Large Synoptic si Sky Telescope, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, that has claimed that with Starlink in the sky, their estimate of about 10 years for the mission has gone up to about 14 or 15 because they expect that so many of their images will be polluted with these images of, of really bright objects crossing the areas that they'll be looking. Uh, there have been some proposals to reduce this problem in really simple ways, uh, like painting the telescope or painting the satellites black. And I don't believe there has been a lot of communication from the group launching the satellites. So the frustration is the lack of communication between astronomers who need the night sky dark and uh, SpaceX, who is doing something that will make internet more accessible for a lot of people, but who is not communicating with the astronomers. If you're interested in this topic, there is a decent chance that there will be an entire talk on it later in the summer. So as to the specific question, by the way, where is Starlink? I believe they're in low Earth orbit is what it's classified as. I don't personally remember where that is, so I wish I could give you a better answer to that question. But they're orbiting quickly enough that uh, if you look up on a night when they're when the Starlink trail, as it's known, is passing, you can often see like a bright point of light crawling across the sky and then following it, another bright point of light crawling across the sky. And it will stay up for about a minute each before sort of fading out across another part of the sky. Low Earth orbit is defined as anything 2,000 kilometers or less. Um, next question. So out of all these discoveries, were there any interesting cul-de-sacs that you know of or the wrong interpretation held out for a while? Can you repeat that one time? Yeah. So out of all of these discoveries, were there any interesting cul-de-sacs that you know of or the wrong interpretation held out for a while? So I assume so much like Vulcan. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a bit stuck in my head on that question because I'm sticking on, uh, I'm stuck on Vulcan. I think that's the craziest cul-de-sac that we've gotten stuck in in astronomy. And it's something that I'm just learning about at this stage in my education. I didn't know about it for most of, for most of my life. So I was really surprised to find out that it existed. I think, uh, I don't know about cul-de-sacs, but one thing I found out while researching this talk is that, uh, when the news was announced, when the news was broken that Pluto was a planet uh, in 1930, before it was sort of demoted much later on as we started finding more objects like it, uh, that a lot of news articles are saying, this thing is the size of Earth. It's gonna be like the new huge planet that, that uh, is just like the ones that we know about in size. And another reported, this is bigger than Jupiter. It's the biggest planet in the solar system. And as uh, we all knew growing up, it was the smallest planet in the solar system. Uh, before it was demoted to dwarf planet. So it was one of those, I, I honestly, I think uh, the idea of Pluto being a planet was kind of a cul-de-sac. The idea that any object that we found like Pluto had to be given planet status because there are so few of them. Uh, and a way we kind of got stuck on that idea. And then as soon as things started to challenge it, uh, we did not expect them and we did not have a plan for them. So related to that, um... Pluto was found in a similar way to Neptune and Uranus. However, Pluto was found by mistake. Uh, people believed there was a big planet affecting the orbits of these two uh, big planets in the outer solar system. They did the calculations. They made a mistake in the calculations, and they happened to be pointing the telescope at the right spot, uh, and they found Pluto. Uh, and so that's why they assumed it was a large planet to be affecting these other two large planets, only to realize that they'd made mistakes, uh, and that is actually a very, very small planet with less surface area than Russia. All right. The next question is, how did the first five planets get their names? So that's one of those things that happened in such early human history that I did a lot of research while preparing this talk, and I, I couldn't find a specific... 
there was no convention where people got together and decided that they were the names. I think they got their, I'm not sure if they got their names from fo folklore, like from, from the existence of those gods that then translated onto the sky, or if people were naming objects in the sky and then those made their way into their folklore. Uh, I'm not sure which one of those options it is. And I, I could not find evidence that it was either one. So I think the, the hardest part about naming a planet in the modern day is we don't really know how the names were chosen in, in prehistory. I could be wrong about that if someone else is more of an expert on this. Yeah, I believe that's pretty accurate um, because they're a name, you know, kind of so long ago, there's not a solid record of why they were named. There's a lot of interpretation. You know, Mars is a very reddish planet and that was sort of associated with the god Mars, which might just be as simple as the red planet must be Mars. Uh, meanwhile, Venus was the dawn star or the evening star. Uh, it was kind of always appearing near the sun in the morning and night. It was kind of a very beautiful scene. So they named it after Venus, the beautiful goddess. Um, but a lot of these are essentially open to interpretation. Uh, the next question is a similar one. How did Maki Maki get its name? I am, again, not 100% sure about this, but uh, there was some frustration as we, as astronomy and the world just became more of a global subject and wasn't just dominated by a few people in in uh, Western Europe and in America. But what happened is a lot of uh, astronomical observatories were placed in Hawaii because the conditions in Hawaii are as good as they get almost anywhere in the world for doing astronomy. Uh, we have these very high mountains where you can place observatories. And I think part of the reason to choose Maki Maki, and I'm not sure about this, was uh, to sort of democratize the idea or to, to make more global the idea that planets could be named by any culture and by anyone involved in astronomy. So it sort of, it broke the monopoly. It broke the, it broke the idea that you had to be a Greek or Roman God from a very specific part of the world to get a planet named after you. Uh, it's worth mentioning that other cultures do have other names for these planets. So Western culture calls uh, Neptune, Neptune. Uh, I believe there are a few countries in Eastern Asia that call it some translation of the word uh, sea sky star. So it's, it's something to do with the sea, but they don't literally call it the word Neptune. So it does vary from place to place throughout the world. Uh, I wish I could answer that more specifically because I am curious about how Makimaki Maki got its name and so the process by which it was chosen. Um, so I, I took a look and it looks like uh, Makimake is uh, also in this vein of deities. Um, it was given the name of a creator deity, uh, a creator of humanity and god of fertility in the myths of the Rapa Nui, the native people of Easter Island. Um, so that is how Makimaki got its name. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, I guess I kind of already inadvertently answered this, is why did we find Pluto first when it's smaller of these protoplanets? Uh, so essentially it was an accident. Um, they thought Uranus and Neptune were being perturbed by some other large planet. Uh, they did their calculations, they pointed the telescope, they found said planet. Um, they did the calculations wrong, but they still found this object that was moving like a planet. So they assumed it was you know, exactly confirming what they had seen. Uh, the next question was, what is the definition of a planet? So let me see if I have this right. Uh, one of you, if you could Google this and, make and just fact check me so that I, I, I have it absolutely correct, that would be great. But uh, it's three parts. And the International Astronomical Union involving astronomers from all over the world was the sort of body that came together and voted on this. It is that a planet has to be uh, orbiting the sun is the first part which all of these obey that uh, condition. It has to be gravitationally bound enough that it's about circular. So if it's like very misshapen, the gravity on the planet is not considered to be strong enough to be a planet. Uh, so even places like Pluto and even much smaller places like Ceres meet that part of the definition. The third part that was added that excluded them is that they have to clear out their local neighborhood. And by neighborhood, that just means anything in about the same orbit needs to have become part of Pluto or part of Ceres for Pluto or Ceres to be, to be considered planets. So something like Jupiter, uh, as it was forming, it became so gravitationally intense and so massive that 
it basically sucked up all of the matter around it and just made it a part of itself. And uh, something like Pluto did not do that. It just didn't become large enough or, or gravitationally intense enough to get rid of all of the matter around it. So that became the definition of a planet is it, it absolutely has to dominate the area that it's in. That was spot on, Nico. Okay, cool. Uh, I planned that. <laughs> And a funny sort of result of the IAU creating that definition, the first part being must be orbiting the sun. It's why that technically planets found in other star systems are not planets, they are exoplanets. Um, it's kind of a frivolous distinction, but it is one that is technical. That is true. It's, uh, it's one of the things that makes me curious about Planet Nine, which is the ongoing search. There is an ongoing search right now for another planet beyond Neptune that we think would be massive enough to clear out the area around it, but it would be so much further away than Neptune that uh, it is very, very difficult to see or to track down exactly where it is. So there's an ongoing search about that. I really wanted to include that in the talk, but I figured it would just go on too long if I, if I included all of those little threads. Uh, it is very worth looking up if you are interested in, in sort of modern planetary research. Is there still a search going on for a planet that is perturbing the bodies around it. It's the exact same way that we found Neptune, but uh, the difference is that the objects that are being perturbed are much further away and it takes modern technology to see them. All right, the next question. Where do things stand as far as the existence of water elsewhere in the solar system? Uh, very positively so far. And the reason is that we have at least a couple of moons and a couple of planets that have not liquid water, but uh, ice, usually at the poles. Most surprising that I actually found out only while researching this talk is Mercury, the hottest planet in the solar system, the one that's closest to the sun, has ice at its poles. And the reason is that sunlight just doesn't uh, reach those parts of the planet enough, it re or reaches it at enough of an angle that it just isn't enough to melt liquid water. So ice has been showing up as we sort of learn more about the solar system in all these places that we that we didn't expect. Uh, we found it in the poles of Mars very famously. Uh, we found it in several of the moons of the larger the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, there is one that I don't feel confident that I will get the name of this moon right. Do you remember the name of the moon that has uh, that is frozen over on the surface and that has possibly liquid water underneath? Europa. Europa. Yeah, yep, Europa. It's believed that Europa may have more liquid water than the entirety of Earth. Right. So that that is a that is the most exciting sort of prospect for water in the solar system because we believe, though haven't confirmed, that it has liquid water and that it has a lot of it. It's also worth noting that many of the comets and smaller asteroids, uh, the comets are made largely of ice. Um, and we have found evidence when we have uh, done surveys of some of the asteroids in the asteroid belt that there are, uh, there's also frozen water in those as well. And a popular pet theory in the field is that uh, much of Earth's water may have actually come from a comet impacting Earth long ago and then melting and then depositing a lot of water onto our surface. Um, All right, so let's take one more question and then let's switch over to uh, the virtual sky tour. We can stick around and answer more of your questions after we uh, start to do that or as we do that. The next question we had was, does Pluto have a magnetic field of any kind? I'm not sure that we know. Uh, Trevor, you're actually the, the person who would be the expert on this of the three of us. Uh, yeah. Not to put you on the spot, but. No. Um, so I can't confirm, but I don't believe Pluto is thought to have any sort of magnetic field. Um, the primary reason is there are two ways that planets get magnetic fields. One is the way in which Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, and uh, the Sun, or I guess Uranus and Neptune, all have magnetic fields, which is you have a conducting liquid uh, plasma-like fluid kind of swirling around, and it's spinning. This creates a MHG dynamo, which generates a huge sort of you know magnetic field that envelops the entire celestial body. This happens on the Sun, this happens on Earth. Um, but for planets like Pluto and Mars or in Jupiter, 
their cores have cooled off. So they don't have this sort of conducting fluid inside them anymore. Uh, and so they don't have the ability to create an MHG dynamo. That doesn't mean magnetic fields don't exist on these other planets. And that is because the sun, the sun has a solar wind, a stream of charged particles constantly coming off of it. Uh, and that in that solar wind is embedded the magnetic field of the sun. It reaches out you know, well past Pluto, um, what we call the heliosphere, sort of this huge magnetic sort of envelope that the sun creates. And as this solar wind streams by planets that have metals in them, it can sort of induce a magnetic field. Um, and so whether or not Pluto has magnetic field, if it does, it's extremely weak. It's not thought to be uh, highly metallic. It's sort of a big comet in a lot of ways, has a lot of ices on it. Uh, and so it's unlikely that it has a magnetic field. If it does, it's something that you would need to have a very sensitive instrument on the surface of Pluto to probably pick up. It's worth mentioning that the, the magnetic field on the sun is so powerful and so complex that uh, in my limited experience, all of the astronomers I've met who study the sun and all of the astronomers I've met who study magnetism are the same people. It's, it's just a huge field and a very difficult one. Uh, and it's, it's, as I understand it, understanding the magnetic activity on the sun is one of the forefronts of trying to understand not just the sun, but stars in general. Yeah. All right, um, are we ready to switch to Stellarium? Uh, yeah, after it. this, people are still around. Uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer the questions that didn't get answered or any more questions that come up. Um, but I think it's important that we get to all the things that we promised that we were gonna get to in a timely fashion. Thank you guys for sending so many questions, by the way. Yeah, those were fantastic. All right, Nico, if you would. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see what we have here. OK, um, <laughs> to my, my co-presenters, can we, can we see Stellarium here? You are, uh, you are streaming. Excellent, let's go. All right, so um, in the spirit of this talk about planets, I am going to be showing you some of the planets in our very own night sky. I know that everyone here may not be from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, or St. Paul or the Twin Cities in general, but that is the sky that I uh, get to look up at, obstructed by clouds tonight, and so that's the sky that I'm going to be showing right now. Uh, for folks in the States, um, the times that I talk about might be a little different, uh, but if you're still in the United States, this is more or less what's gonna be up in the sky tonight. Uh, unfortunately here, it is quite cloudy as I mentioned, um, so you won't necessarily, unless it happens to clear up, be able to go out and look at these, but most of these planets should stick around uh, for the next few days. So if we get a clear night, I, I would, uh, encourage that you go out and check them out. Um, so this is, as we've mentioned, this is Stellarium. It is a virtual planetarium program. And what it does is it simulates the, the sky. Um, what I've got here is I've got the sky as it would appear now if the sky weren't covered with clouds. Uh, this is the view from Minneapolis. Uh, this is me looking south. And this is what we would see out right now. There are some stars that are poking out even through the, uh, through the light, um, but it's still fairly light. There's not a lot in the sky. So this is pointing south right now. Uh, and if you would all take a moment to kind of orient yourselves, so you kind of know where I'm talking about. And if you wanna go out in the next couple of days to look for some of these planets, you'll be able to do so. So find, take a moment and find which way south is from you. Um, if you've got a feeling for that sort of thing, great, not everyone does. Uh, so feel free to you know, take out a map or ask someone around you if they happen to know which way south is. Uh, and then we can, we can get started there with a little bit more uh, situational awareness, so to speak. So if you all have that, um, and I think Nico is pointing south, south is actually that way for me, uh, so I can look off to my left and see clouds. So this that I'm showing you right now uh, is, the, is pretty much the current time. It's, all right, I'm, I'm 10 minutes behind this right now, uh, but it's not all that much of a difference. And I am looking, as I said, at the south, southeast sky. So there's not a lot interesting happening right now. Planet-wise, I'm going to go forward a little bit in time. Uh, and 
Oh, just one hour, we go to about 10 o'clock, 1040, and we see Jupiter, our first planet of the night that is cresting the horizon in the southeast. So that's gonna be if you're facing south, like you found, uh, if you turn to your left about 45 degrees, you'll be able to see Jupiter coming up. Um, and Jupiter is, uh, you know, it's the largest of the planets. And if I manage to select it, I can zoom in here and go a little too far uh, and see it. And so here we have Jupiter, the big glass planet, just like you saw in the presentation. And around it, you see some bright objects. Four of these, the brightest ones, are the Galilean moons that Nico mentioned. Uh, but if I zoom out just a little bit more, you can see that Jupiter actually has a number of, of smaller moons that are in among it. Uh, if I come back out, you can see that Jupiter is a very bright spot on the sky. And as I advance time for it a little more, so now we're at just coming up on midnight, about 20 till midnight, we've noticed that Saturn has also come up and joined Jupiter in the night sky. Uh, and these are two planets that should stick around for a while here in the summer. We should be able to look to the south, southeast if you're in uh, Minnesota and you can see Jupiter and Saturn. They're visible by the naked eye when there's not clouds in the way. So I encourage you, if, again, if it clears up the next couple of days to go out and take a look. They're really pretty. Uh, Saturn, like I said, is my favorite planet. Um, this is about, okay, you won't, unless you have a particularly good telescope, you won't be able to see the moons of Saturn. Uh, but this is about what you can see through kind of your, your average everyday, pretty decent, you know, six, seven inch telescope. Um, is you can clearly make out the ring structure, but we're on a, on a computer program, so we can actually zoom in a little bit more. And you can see the myriad wealth of little moons that Saturn has orbiting around it. Uh, not pictured here, uh, but something that I found very interesting was that some of the gaps in Saturn's rings are supposed to be, uh, they're supposed to be resonances with some of the moons and the particles that make up Saturn's rings have, been scattered away from particular orbits that are disturbed by certain, uh, certain moons of Saturn. And so we come right back out uh, and we're going to, if I can get back to kind of ground level, we're gonna go forward in time a little bit more. I'm gonna try to deselect Saturn so that I'm still looking at my horizon here because uh, to the east, as we get to about two in the morning, uh, we can see Mars coming up. Oop, I've gone past it, let me try to select it here. And then there is the red planet. Uh, one of the fun facts about Mars is that it is the only planet in the solar system currently completely inhabited by robots. Um, so at least for the time being, it is a, it's a fairly robot-centric planet. It's got two moons, Phobos and Deimos, uh, named for the demigod, I believe, sons of Mars, uh, whose domains were kind of fear and terror, really really pleasant guys. Uh, but that that is also going to be visible by by just your eye in, in the night sky. As we go a little bit further in time, you see it'll come up off the horizon a bit. Um, now it's, it's worth noting that the what the planetarium here is simulating is the sky with the light pollution of the Twin Cities. Now if I take and turn that off and turn my light pollution way down, and oh no, there's a window is in the way. Uh, we can see that there's a lot more in the sky than just so much so that I there we go, keep clicking on things. There's so much more in the sky than just these bright planets. And this is why the close, close by planets were some of the, uh, the first things that were really noticed and written down by the ancient astronomers because they're very noticeable in the night sky. I'm gonna turn us back up to what we actually see from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And now you'll notice that there is another red line here. These red lines are the orbits of the planets currently on screen, but I only see one planet on screen. Why could that be? Oh, oh, that's why. Because there's Uranus. If I you know, type it in and do my nice search, I can zoom in on it and see this beautiful planet, but it's not visible by the naked eye, especially not with the light pollution of the Twin Cities. 
So if you're going to go planet hunting in the spirit of the ancients or the not so ancients as the case may be, uh, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter are going to be your best bets for this time of year. Uh, at different times of the year, you can also uh, see, Mer well, you can see Venus easily. Um, Mercury is a little trickier just because it's so close to the sun and so small. Uh, but that's going to be kind of your best bet for the night sky. Again, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are going to be nice and bright. Uh, they're going to be up in the sky for at least the next week or so off the top of my head. And so, uh, I, I, again, you know, if you, if you have time, if the skies clear up, I definitely recommend taking some time uh, sometime this week and going and looking to the south. And you should see a few wandering stars. All right, thanks, Alexander. Uh, I think we have a few more questions that we can get through. Uh, if anyone wants to see anything in particular that's in more detail in Stellarium, we can also share that. So uh, we are really open to whatever you are interested in. Uh, we plan this event from eight to nine, so we should wrap up relatively soon, but uh, let's see if we can get through a few more of the questions on the list. All right, where we left off, there was a question on why did no big planet form in the uh, asteroid belt. This is one that I wish I understood better. Uh, and I, I, I do believe that that's, there's a lot of ongoing debate about that. Uh, I don't know that we've come to an answer about it. Uh, do either of you have a more specific answer than I have? Or I think uh, it's because of Jupiter. Um, so Jupiter, because of its immense size, kind of perturbed everything within that orbital range. Uh, kind of prevented it from being able to fully accrete, um, which kind of pushes the question further back, which is why is Jupiter there? And it has to do with the sun's radiation not allowing gases, you know, really light uh, particles to sort of form close to the sun. And so as you got sort of further and further out, you had sort of the first point where gases could sort of accrete together. You got the biggest planet Jupiter forming there. And that in turn prevented anything close to it from forming, like uh, the asteroid belt. That sounds awesome. I, the only thing I was going to add to that is before the planets formed, uh, most of the solar system looked like the asteroid belt looks, but even more chaotic. Uh, rather than like asteroids or, or the sort of small bodies that are in the asteroid belt, it looked a lot more like uh, just a giant cloud of dust and gas with no organization at all. So it's only through planet formation that we've ended up with most of those most of that gas dust and most of what would have been asteroids became these much larger planets. Uh, the asteroid belt was kind of this preserved part of our history that like, that's what the solar system used to look like and would have continued to look like did we not have these much larger things holding everything together. I do believe it's very uncertain how we get from dust planet decimals to like actual planets forming. There's steps in there that are kind of really confusing. Right, the, the biggest problem with solar system research right now is that we only have one and it's very hard to make any guesses based on just one solar system. We know that we have uh, inner planets that are rocky and outer planets that are gaseous and an asteroid belt. We have no idea right now how many other systems like that there are. And we're hoping to get a better understanding of that soon because we have some telescopes searching for exoplanets. But that search is still sort of just beginning and it's been going on over the last 10 years. And then the final question that we had posted here, um kind of related to the Stellarium talk that was given. So which is, what objects or interesting things can we see with a backyard telescope? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Aunt Carolyn. That is my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the most interesting one is Saturn. Uh, that's my absolute number one. That is one of the things that seeing that through a telescope inspired me to go into astronomy. Uh, I think part of the reason it's fun to give a talk on the planets is that since we can't do telescope viewings right now because we're not able to gather in person, uh, the planets are the highlight. Anytime we can look at something in a telescope, uh, I always try to get either Saturn or Jupiter because they're just so fun to look at, Jupiter for its moons and for its sort of marble-like structure, and then Saturn for its rings and that like utterly gorgeous structure that it has. Uh, so I would say those are the two top ones that you should look at. Uh, the only exception being the moon is also fascinating in a telescope. And that uh, historically is what Galileo looked at first. And 
I think it's what sort of started him along the path of studying the planets as closely as he did, because he saw suddenly like mountains on the moon and all of these like ridges and craters that we had never realized were there, even though they were sort of hidden in plain sight. I would, I would really second that. That's what I was going to say. And if your reaction is, oh, I, seen, I see the moon every single day. Uh, if you haven't seen it through a telescope, I really, really recommend it. It is just absolutely beautiful. I will support looking at the moon. Uh, the being able to see like the visual depth of craters and things is, as opposed to seeing pictures of seeing with your own eyes, is a pretty amazing thing. All right, I, that was the last question that was posted in chat, I believe. Um, we are at nine oh one, so we are at time. Uh, if there are any final questions, if you'll have, we can probably answer them. Otherwise. We want to you know, thank everyone for coming. Thank you for the questions. Um, look forward to having more of these streams going forward. We hope to launch, uh, this was our sort of first trial event, uh, to, be, to be fully honest. So we're hoping to launch a much more uh, consistent series of events with involving more graduate students and more topics and more activities, hopefully, in uh, mid-July. So starting around uh, the second week of July on Wednesdays is the current plan. So uh, we will keep you up to date. We will send you an update by the email list that uh, I think many of you got this invitation. And uh, yeah, we'll do our best to, to involve all of you in the future. And thank you all again so much for coming. All right, thank you so much.